Hey there, YouTube. Help us out by hitting that like button and subscribing to the YouTube channel if you haven't already. We have a bunch to talk about today. Sleepers, Scott's Tout Wars team. Will there be baseball? We'll break it all down next on Fantasy Baseball Today. Welcome to the Fantasy Baseball Today podcast from CBS Sports. Oh, and first pitch crushing! Got a fantasy question? Email fantasybaseball at cbsi.com. Get ready to win your league. Where fantasy becomes reality. Now, here's Frank, Scott, and Chris. It's the middle of March. We finished our position previews. We're doing live mock drafts. You know what that means. It's time for sleepers, breakouts, and busts. Welcome into Fantasy Baseball today on Thursday, March 10th. I am Frank Sample, joined by Scott White and Chris Towers. There is so much to talk about today. We will focus on our favorite sleepers this upcoming season. We'll break down Scott's Tout Wars team. And of course, we will get to the latest on the labor negotiations. But Scott, I want to start on a positive note. So why don't you kick us off with your favorite sleeper in fantasy baseball this season? Ooh, narrowing it down to one player is difficult. And I just want to reiterate for people who may only listen to the sleepers version of the podcast. My favorite two players to draft this year are, are the catcher Salvador Perez and the starting pitcher, Charlie Morton. I don't think either of them qualify as sleepers really. Um, so I'm not going to say them. I think my favorite sleeper, it's a three-way tie. Three three players who are in a very similar predicament. You it's can never forgot- just follow the rules. No, I can't. I'm a rule breaker. <laughs> the forgotten ace trio of Kyle Hendricks, Carlos Carrasco, and Zach Greinke. That's it. All right, Scott. Well, <laughs> who is your favorite to draft of that trio? Would you like to expand uh, more on one of those players? Let's talk about Kyle Hendricks. He was the one that you yeah, said. Yeah, well, he probably is the favorite to draft, even even though he's the, the most worst, boring. Well, the worst bet for strikeouts. The reason he's my favorite to draft is because he's the youngest and because um, it's hardest to make the case for a decline with him. None of them, none of those three lost velocity last year really so you know that that's why i feel good about or or at least pretty good about all three of their chances to bounce back but yeah they're all going outside the top 200 they're like they've basically been discarded by fantasy baseball even though for most of the last decade they've been drafted as top 20 top 25 starting pitchers um and yeah they were all bad last year but like I said, the velocity was was normal. I, I think in Kyle Hendricks' case, and this probably applies to Zach Granke a little bit too, is you know they, they throw like 88 miles per hour. They're they're among the softest tossing starting pitchers, and that just leaves you a, a narrower margin for error. Uh, I think Hendricks, you know, he was probably missing his spots a little. The fact that the ball was changing, the seam height of the ball was changing over the course of the season. It wasn't consistent from start to finish. May have had a little something to do with it, uh, or may not have. But but in either case, like it's it's not going to take much for him to rebound to the pitcher we've known him to be the last seven years. I think, and uh, considering you can get him with one of your last few picks, is like why not? Why <laughs> like what what who, what? Who in that range is going to provide more upside? Uh, that, that is a fair question. Um, I mean, the ADP for Kyle Hendricks is 249.4. Uh, so I will pull up some other names that he's going around. But what I especially like about Kyle Hendricks in this range is finding a pitcher that can help you in the whip category this late in your drafts, or even if you're just talking about a, a target in a head-to-head points league. I mean, he's someone that consistently goes deep into his starts, He's given you a bunch of quality starts over the past, you know, handful of years, basically. I mean, I think we can go back even further than that. So it really doesn't matter what format, but really, I mean, the whip category to find that this late in your drafts, it is very appealing. Um, And of course, you know, last year, a down season for Kyle Hendricks, but in his career, everything leading up to last year, 2014 through 2020, he made 174 starts, 3-1-2 ERA, 1-1-0 whip. So 
there's oh. a chance that he's just done. But if that's the yeah. case, I mean, this late in your drafts, you can drop him a month in, into the season, and, and it's it's not really going to hurt you. And and I do want to clarify, how are you going to get more upside than that at starting pitcher this late in the draft? Good. I want to address something Gennardo Napoli said in the comments section, where why not take a shot on the next generation? Because they might... Well, they that, might only give you 120 innings. Like, so, Kyle Hendricks, like, if, if you, part of what makes you an ace is throwing a crap load of innings, and you're not going to do that straight out of the minor leagues, buddy. So, uh, you, my thought when you said that was like, how, who are you going to find with more upside? Well, like, it, it's always like Josiah Gray or Luis Patino or Tony Gonsolin, who I know you like a lot. Um, uh, kind of running out of names after that, but Chris Paddock. Um, yeah, it's it's not impossible to find Reed Detmers, who's someone I really like. It's not impossible to find theoretical upside. Uh, right. Late in drafts, that's that's all you're looking for, really. A starting pitcher is is upside at that point in the draft. It's just is that the same thing as realistic upside? Now, I think Luis right. Patino is someone who has realistic upside he was like the fastball was really good the slider was really good he probably needs to throw his secondary pitches more but he's incredibly talented he throws really hard and like yeah, yeah he might only throw 140 innings this season right. 130 innings but he might have 70 more strikeouts than kyle hendricks with he similar ratios and now he I, might I, not he might not I, because i kind of lump that trio together um of the three, the one with the most upside is Carlos Carrasco. Mm. Like, if you're if you're just looking for the singular late round pitcher with the most upside, it's Carlos Carrasco. I would say. But the the thing about Hendricks is, this is 2021 was probably the first time. I mean, really, since he established himself as an everyday pitcher, probably since really since his debut, the first season where he wasn't not just a positive con contributor for your fantasy team, but an incredibly good value for where you drafted him or what he cost in a, in a salary cap auction league. So that's where it's like, I don't know. People have been waiting for the like magic trick of Kyle Hendricks career to die off at some point. And maybe that's what happened last season. But I think it's also worth keeping in mind that it wasn't like he was hurt. It wasn't like he his velocity was down, like Scott said. Not really, anyway. It, it mostly seems like he's a guy with a very slim margin for error, and he got on the wrong side of it. You know, he missed a few too many times, and when you don't have great stuff, that can catch up to you really quickly. That's yeah. it's something that we talked about the other day with, like, um, oh, I can't remember who it was that we were talking about, but Robbie Ray, where, like, you can get away with having middling control when you throw like that, when your pitches move like that. Mm -hmm. Kyle Hendricks can't get away with that. And so it's just a question of like, was he just off last year or was it the start of a decline? It's hard to answer that, but I'm willing to bet when the price is this low on yeah. someone with, you know, an eight year track record, like Kyle Hendricks. Yeah. That, I mean, that's the thing. Like they've been discarded. Nobody wants right. these guys. <laughs> like they, they've just been, you, you know, they're, they're, they're complete afterthoughts. Half your league might not even think to draft them at all. Um, so that's, that's part of the argument, it, but for Hendricks specifically, there was a stretch of 13 starts in the middle of last year. Remember, we're all like, yeah, I guess Hendricks is fine. 13 starts, 12 of them were quality starts. He had a 250 ERA during that stretch. And then he got hit hard again the last two months. So like even within last year, he showed us Kyle Hendricks is still there. Yep. I, I'm, I'm with you, Scott. I drafted him in TGFBI. I just said it again. I'm with you, Scott. I'm probably going to say that a few more times throughout the course of this podcast, I'd imagine. Uh, but uh, I wanted to mention Carlos Carrasco. He was He's my favorite sleeper. I've done probably five or six drafts that I'm actually playing out this year. Some of them are draft and holds. But I keep winding up with Carlos Carrasco because he just goes so late. His ADP is 287.8, so he's going almost 40 picks after Kyle Hendricks, and it was a mess of a season for Carrasco last year. Torn hamstring kept him out until July 30th, and then he was just awful once he returned. An ERA over six, 1.43 whip. Uh, and uh, overall, um, after the season, he had to have uh, surgery to remove a bone fragment from his right elbow. 
Uh, so, I, you know, look, obviously he's dealt with a lot of injuries the past couple of seasons. He's up there in age, but uh, he's been rehabbing, training. Everything that I've read is he's basically good to go. We had Derek Rhodes on the podcast yesterday for some injury updates, and he seemed optimistic on Carlos Carrasco as well. Uh, but you look closer at last season. The velocity was fine. He threw his uh, slider and curve a little bit l less um, than mm -hmm. you'd like to see. But mm -hmm. overall, I, I'm I'm there on Carlos Carrasco. He was great in 2020. I get it, short season, only 12 starts. Uh, but he was like a top 30 starting pitcher during that span. And I will take a shot on him. How much? Going as late as he is. How much do you think the the thing with Carrasco is just there's a perce perception that this is a slide that he's on? That like we're going on two out of the yeah. last three years not being good. But yeah. And like technically that is correct. But. It's worth remembering 2019, he, he was dealing with a cancer diagnosis. Right. Yeah. You know, he, right. he came back from that and pitched out of the bullpen. And like, that's an incredibly difficult thing to come back from. Then he comes back in 2020, looks like himself, just looks like the plain version of Carlos Carrasco, who had been very good for nearly a decade at this point. And then last year, he just, it might be as simple as he just never had a chance last year. Once he had that hamstring injury, and it was during spring training when he had the hamstring injury, right? Yep. Yeah. And he was yeah. dealing with like an elbow thing before that. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the elbow thing, like he kind of said, like, I always have a sore elbow in tr spring training, which take that for what it's worth. But I think it's the hamstring injury where it's just like, he just couldn't do anything for like three months. Yep. And so I don't know how much you hold it against him. In, in terms of like his chances to bounce back, at least I think you can hold it against him to a certain extent, but I think his chances to bounce back are much better than his price indicates. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you on the, okay, two of the last three years, his numbers have been bad and a lot of projection systems use three year averages as a starting point. And so it's just a, it's just a unfair cutoff for Carrasco. Yeah. If you're, if you're projecting his numbers based on specifically the last three years, um, because there were two major health issues and then the year in between he was awesome. He was, he was Carlos Carrasco still. So that I want to say that, but I also wanted to say uh, like, when I look at, when I, when I, when I try to nail down what specifically went wrong for him beyond the, just the nebulous, Oh, he was hurt. And, and so he wasn't quite right. Specifically the slider looks like it didn't have the same bite on it. It wasn't getting the whiffs like we're used to seeing. And that, it totally jibes with the idea, okay, he didn't get a chance to build up like a pitcher normally would during the course of the season. I mean, those secondaries take a while to come around, and he just had to jumpstart it uh, in a way he wouldn't normally have to. So I I think, yeah, I mean, it sounds like we're all on the same page with Carlos Carrasco. Yeah, I will say from a roster construction perspective, I've wound up with him on a lot of 15-team leagues as pro probably my SP6 or SP7 you don't want to draft him on a team where you have a lot of other risks earlier on. So just keep that in mind. If you take a couple of maybe uh, injury risks at starting pitcher earlier in your draft, maybe Carrasco isn't for you. Maybe a Kyle Hendricks makes more sense because he's a higher floor, doesn't really have as much injury risk. But uh, if you feel safe about your pitching staff, then uh, feel free to take that risk on Carrasco later on in your drafts. Chris, you've already alluded to it, but your favorite sleeper this season is blank. Well, I don't know if I've specifically alluded to who my favorite is. Maybe I've just talked about him a ton over the last few months. I mean, there are lots of guys, um, but the guy I'm the guy I think is my favorite. The guy that I've probably tied myself to the most is Luke Voigt. And I, I think the case is should be fairly obvious because it's just whenever Luke Voigt's been healthy since getting to the Yankees, he's been awesome. Like we're we're talking about a 764 OPS as if it's a disaster. Like you, you think about some of the seasons that guys have had that have been actual disasters. Look at Cody Bellinger last year. Like that was a disaster. Luke Voigt was still an above average major league hitter in his worst season when he wasn't healthy. And yes, it's a bad sign that that was enough to ultimately get him benched. And then, you know, he required surgery, but we're going on four years now since he got to the Yankees, 1133 plate appearances. An 883 OPS, uh, 162 game pace, over 100 RBI, over 100 runs, over 30 home runs. He's just a really, really good hitter. 
And yes, we don't know if he's going to play every day for the Yankees. Yes, maybe they sign Freddie Freeman and they trade for Matt Olson and there's nowhere for him to play and it's just a disaster for him. But if Luke Voigt plays like Luke Voigt, he's going to hit somewhere, whether it's in the Yankees lineup because Giancarlo Stanton gets hurt or something like that, or the Yankees trade him somewhere else. I just can't see a world in which Luke Voigt's putting up his normal high 800s, low 900s OPS bat, and he isn't in someone's lineup eventually. It's the kind of thing that just works itself out. He's not such a bad base runner or such a bad defender that he just is. It's, it's not a Jose Martinez situation uh, for those of you who remember him. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, I just think like Luke Voigt goes like 230th overall, I think yeah. in, in NFC drafts. And it just, yeah, it seems like a no brainer that right. he should be. I mean, there's, there's a group I, I'm doing an ADP review by position and there's like a group of late round first baseman who it's just like, one of these guys should be on your roster. And it's like Luke Voigt, Alex Kirilov, Brandon Bell, Spencer Turkelson. And it's like one of those guys should be on your team. And Luke Voigt's going to be one of those guys for me in a lot of situations. I, I think the key to what you were saying is, is yeah, I mean, the ADP, um, it's actually closer to 2-4. Like he's barely being drafted in 12 team yeah. leagues. So it's... 66 Look, there, in NFC drafts. It sounds like there's a lot of momentum for yet the Yankees bringing in a first baseman to replace him. And that has to be the justification for him going that late. But because it's pushed him to that late, it's a no risk yeah. gamble that they don't have a chance to bring in another guy before the season starts. Or, 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 or that someone's going to get hurt. Right. Someone always gets hurt. Gets hurt. Um, and not I just for the Yankees, but obviously for the Yankees specifically. 901 OPS since joining the Yankees has homered at a rate higher than Matt Olson during that same stretch. Um, and that includes two seasons that were marred by injury. Yeah. He's managed to achieve those numbers in spite of it. So I'm, I'm totally with you. Like Luke Voigt is Luke Voigt is often the reason I can't bring myself to draft Nelson Cruz <laughs> because then I can't, then I don't have that utility spot open for Luke Voigt because I've already taken an extra corner corner infielder or whatever. Scott, something you mentioned spot. there, something you mentioned there, Scott, that I think is uh, worth maybe talking about a little bit more has been the injuries for Luke Voigt. He was limited to just 68 games last year due to a torn meniscus in his left knee, a strained right oblique. He's also played through some foot issues the past couple of years, but I mean, really, his old tank- surgery I yeah. think in the, after the 2020 off, 2019 off yep. season. Yeah, uh, really, his whole tenure with the Yankees has been mired by injury. I mean, there's no doubt that when he's on the field, he's been really awesome. The home run king in the short in 2020. You mentioned the numbers he's put up since he's joined the Yankees. Like, there's no doubt when he's on the field, he's great. He's also a pretty terrible defender. So I don't know. Maybe that factors into their decision to ultimately bring in a first baseman. Uh, I, I think it's more likely than not that they do that. But again, he either gets shipped out somewhere or usually these things find a way of, of working themselves out. I will ask you, Chris. Uh, say that we find out two weeks before the season that Luke Voigt's going to be the Yankees starting first baseman on opening day. What's his ADP in that two week span of drafts leading up to opening day? Cause right now it's two thirty seven. If you knew he was the Yankees first baseman, what would it be? If you knew Luke Voigt was going to be the opening day first baseman, is there any reason he shouldn't be part of the profit pocket? Is there any reason Uh, he shouldn't be drafted around CJ Crone and Josh Bell and Reese Hoskins? Like, is there any reason to take Jared Walsh or Ryan Mountcastle ahead of him? Those guys are both going ahead of the profit pocket, which is bizarre. Like, yeah, I I was going to say he might be a top 100 pick. I was going to say half his ADP 120 with with top 60 potential. Yeah, Yeah, I think he would be ranked just behind Jose Abreu. I would rank him in the top 100. He would be just ahead of the profit pocket, I think. Yep. He would be ahead of Votto for us, I believe. Crone, uh, Josh Bell. But yep. yeah, he's he's right in that mix. He'd probably be ahead of them. So uh, if you're drafting now, there's a lot of potential, obviously, for Voight. Um, but again, like I don't want to downplay the downside. It's, you know, there's injuries and obviously playing time risk as well. Uh, before we get into, we'll get to more sleepers a little bit later on, of course. Uh, I want to get into Scott's Tout Wars team as well, which he drafted uh I guess when you're listening to this, it's going to be two nights ago. Uh, but 
we've got to talk about the latest in the labor negotiations. So here's what's going on. Rob Manfred announced the removal of two more series postponing opening day until April 14th, mostly because of the reintroduction of an international draft. It, I don't know. It just kind of came to became this huge talking point the past couple of days where, you know, they're closing in on economic issues and, you know, it seems like they were finally finding some common ground there. Uh, I don't and, even remember it being mentioned before today, before Wednesday. Yeah, that's that was like the most ironic part of all this is that the main holdup was the, the CBT and, you know, what level that was going to be at and the thresholds. And it feels like they're all of a sudden they're pretty close there. Uh, and then now we have the international draft. So, well, we'll see what happens ultimately. But um, there were three options proposed by the league. The players counted, countered. It was it was a whole mess. Uh, and then two hours later, I mean, which is like two hours from ago, like from when we we're recording this right now, uh, apparently the two sides are talking again. So deep into the night, even though they've canceled games, I, I opted against I doing think, an emergency I think they podcast. Canceled them. Yeah. Well, I, that that's so. It's it's worth mentioning that the statement from Rob Manfred does not say canceled games. He removed it says removed them from the schedule. And now that's also part of the reason I'm sure that they left that wording is every team, I believe, plays at least one division game in the first four series. And so you've got to make those up. You can, I don't I don't know how you can just, well, sorry, you're just going to play your division opponent one fewer time. I, I feel like that's probably not fair. So I I'm assuming this happens sometime soon and from reading the reports it sounds like the sticking point on mlb's end for the offer that the players made was that it was past the deadline more than that it was an untenable offer because apparently it was an offer that the owners had made to the players the night before right. so it does seem like this is not an insurmountable thing unless they insist on canceling games and not playing 162 because then you have to renegotiate player salaries and right. figure all that stuff out. That's when it gets really thorny. And that's so, why we we need to figure this out. We, as if we're part of it, but I think <laughs> the players and the owners, they need to figure this out now. And it feels like they're so close because, you know, if you move further away from this point, then again, you're going to have to figure out those player salaries. They're going to want to get paid for the entire season. They're going to want a full year of service time, obviously. So uh, it will get messy if they start to cancel uh, more games. Jagger Robinson Day is the 15th? Correct. So one thing that I think they would love to do is have that be opening day. And also, I just think like that feels like a real deadline. Like canceling that feels like a real black like in in addition to all of this just being a generally bad look for the game i feel like canceling jackie robinson day would just be a really really tough look and i i would imagine they're gonna try harder than they have been to avoid that specific outcome that's me being optimistic it's the it's the 75th anniversary of him yes debuting too Right. Yeah. And I don't know, maybe I'm just naive. There was a report from John Heyman, which take it with a grain of salt. It kind of seems like he's a mouthpiece for the owners at this point. But I feel like if they figure this out, like they'll just kind of rescind the statement and they'll be like, yeah, we'll yeah. play 162 games. But I mean, it's just like the idea that like if they had come to an agreement at 557 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on March 9th, we would have 162 games. But right. be, if they come to an agreement on, you know, at 1157 a.m. on March 10th, we only get 100 like that. That seems stupid. If they get it done in the next few days, there's going to be a full season. I'm very, very confident in that. It's just and I feel a like fairly sizable, daylight. a Luke Voigt sized if still. I, I I feel like we saw daylight today, you know, there in like real because, day, not like last week's like, oh, mm -hmm. the owners are optimistic. Yeah, because because it, it doesn't sound like they're arguing over the numbers so much anymore. And it was just what exact like the owners are not demanding an international draft be put in place mm -hmm. uh they are wanting to continue to discuss it and at at last report um if if you know they they were looking for like an opt out basically if they if they yeah. couldn't agree it at some point in the next two or three years uh agreed to an internet the terms of an international draft so like 
Like that that doesn't sound like enough to keep holding this up. Yeah, like for, I, for I either like, side, really. I feel like it's like from the player's perspective, getting a here are your three offers. Do you have to take one of them or we're done? Was like there's no way you can do that. The the precedent that, that would set for future negotiations is awful. You can't do that. And the MLB thing, I think, was just like, oh, our deadline. So I, it does feel like it's less about the structural issues at this point, mm -hmm. hopefully. All right. Uh, of course, if anything happens, I'm sure we will have an emergency podcast for you and, and get you the latest between the MLB, uh, between MLB and the players. But uh, yeah, fingers crossed. And, and we're hoping that... Um, we can still get into full season somehow, some way. Scott, let's talk about your Tout Wars team. And for those watching us live on YouTube or on demand, I'm going to pull up the draft board here so you can uh, potentially follow along. It's you know, very colorful. It's very colorful. The The names are kind of small, but I don't know. Maybe there's a way for you to like zoom in and, and you could check it out. But uh, I feel like it's a nice little visual element to follow along here. I'll uh, put the link in the... Uh, podcast description as well if anyone wants to follow along but this is a 15 team five by five roto industry league filled with the best minds out there scott was drafting smack daddy in the middle eighth out of 15 of course started with vladimir guerrero that is all i will reveal uh, we did <laughs> we revealed one other player on yesterday's podcast that was bartolo cologne i'll let you talk about that scott uh, <laughs> but walk us through your draft here what you were thinking and overall what you like or don't like about the scene all right, so one thing you didn't mention is 5x5, five five, but OBP instead right. of batting average. And that, I think, is critical, not so much for what I did, but for what other people did. Because, I, I don't know, I, I got the sense certain people were trying to show off that they, ah, I know this guy gains value in an OBP league and just, like, inflated his value beyond belief. Good examples of this are Jesse Winker and Max Muncy, both going in round three. Uh, Joey Gallo went in round five. Um, there were a few picks like that. And so like, it, it, and meanwhile, most of the other hitters were going generally where you'd expect them to go. Like I, I kind of gambled in, in, in the middle of round three, I took Austin Riley to address the third base, um, scarcity, uh, consider taking Salvador Perez, all things being equal. I think I'd rather have Salvador Perez, but I was hoping because Salvador Perez is a bad OBP guy, he could fall to me in round four. Didn't happen. Somebody still took him in round three. So generally speaking, the high OBP hitters got ele elevated considerably. The low OBP hitters still went about where they normally go, with some exceptions. And basically just the starting pitchers got pushed down. I did not plan on building a pitcher heavy team. That's what I did two years ago when I won the league. That's what I tried to do last year when everybody was doing it. And then MLB pulled the rug out from under me by cha changing the ball and making and changing the entire pitcher market. And, and that's why I've um, drastically changed my approach this year. My, my approach going in was what I've been touting all along. Go heavy on the power. If you have, if you have, if if you if your team is good at hitting home runs, chances are it's going to be good at offense overall, um, and especially in an OBP league. Yes, be intentionally unintentional about stolen bases. Just you know, accumulate them by happenstance, and hopefully it'll be enough for you to finish in the middle of the category. And then don't go overboard at starting pitcher. Draft enough, but don't go overboard. That was my approach. That's not how it turned out. Uh, so after Vladimir Guerrero in round one, eighth overall, totally thrilled with that. Obviously he's my number two player in this format. So to get him eighth overall, wasn't anything I was going to pass up. Uh, Bo Bichette almost made it to me in round two, miraculously, not a great OBP guy relative to the batting average. So I guess that's why it happened, but, uh, I would, that would have been amazing if I got him around two. It's not what happened. So it was between Ozzy Albies and Zach Wheeler, uh, Albies loses value in an OBP league relative to batting average, and I'm not thrilled with taking him in round two anyway. I like a mm -hmm. lot of the second baseman available in the round four through six range, so I took Zach Wheeler. All right, second round pick, starting pitcher. Not necessarily something I'm looking to do this year. For what it's worth, both of the third basemen were gone, Devers and Machado. So, you know, Wheeler. Uh, I mentioned I took Austin Riley in round three. 
Round four, Sandy Alcantara was there in the middle of round four in a 15-team league. That value just seemed incredible to me. I Sandy. had to take him. Uh, Jose Altuve in round five, fine. That's you know that's kind of why I didn't take Ozzy Albies earlier. Brian Reynolds in round six, first outfielder. Okay, fine. He gains he gains value in an OBP league as well. Scott Brian Reynolds over Kyle Schwarber though. I know you had to be thinking about it. Well, Brian Reynolds goes much earlier than Kyle Schwarber. I didn't. Brian Kyle Schwarber went with the very next pick, which I wasn't anticipating. I thought I had a round or two at least before Kyle Schwarber was somebody I needed to consider. Uh, so somebody, you know, somebody went early for Kyle Schwarber, and that's fine. Um, so yeah, three hitters there with my first five picks. But that's when things kind of took a turn. So what I ended up doing in this draft, I don't feel like I'm structuring my explanation here very well, but that's fine. Five of my first 10 picks ended up being starting pitcher. Seven of my first 14 picks ended up being starting pitchers. I went heavier on starting pitcher this year than I did last year when I thought it was the only way to win. And the reason that happened is because beginning with Alcantara in round four, the values just were insane. So Charlie Morton in round seven, Justin Verlander in round eight, the pitcher version of Shohei Otani in round 10, that's who Bartolo Colon is there. It's, it's just a placeholder for the pitcher version of Shohei Otani. Um, and then I figured I was done. Five of my first 10, right? I got to get all that power I wanted. Round 13, Ranger Suarez was there. And it's just like, come on, guys. This is stupid. I got to take Ranger Suarez. He's going to be such a good source of the ERA. It was between... Him or Nelson Cruz for me. Obviously, I was looking to make up ground in power. Nelson Cruz, you know, that that's the one, that's the one I really wonder about. Should I have gone Nelson Cruz there instead of Ranger Suarez? Because Nelson Cruz went with the very next pick. And then before it got back to me, Hunter Renfro went as well. Um, so then I was just like, whatever, Adam Wainwright is still there. In round See, 14, he was a top 10 pitcher last year. I'll go ahead and take him. I do need to jump in though. Okay, I go think ahead. That's the wrong. I think well, Suarez is fine. I don't think both Suarez and Wainwright. Well, who was I necessary? supposed to like, take instead of Wainwright? Well, Adam I get the like, ball? oh, it's great value, but like if you needed to make up ground and power, you didn't have a shortstop yet. You could have taken the flyer on O'Neill Cruz at you know 210th yeah, that's overall. Too early, or though. That's Alex Kirilov. Round 14 for O'Neill Cruz. That's it's a 15 early. team league. I know, but They're I got two hundred over twenty of TGFBI or eighteen. Right, right, right. But it's but like it's or Luke Voigt went within the next yeah. round, or Adam yeah. Duvall, or yeah. Adolis it, Garcia. It just seemed too early for those guys. Like, why Andrew would I? Vaughn, why would I, I take those risky players when I got a top ten pitcher? Available? Well, because Adam Wainwright's not a top ten pitcher. He I, was last year. He was. Yes, but he's he did, not. He, You're he not ranking him as the exact same numbers in 2020 as well. Right, yeah. but you reach a point of diminishing returns when you when you have that many pitchers and Adam nah. Wainwright. Like, yes, he may be a top ten pitcher again, but it requires a lot of things to go right it, it in a way that you to don't be as necessarily good as he's been in his last forty five starts. Right, but you don't need it. Right, I, I think wow. in a league this deep, in a fifteen team league, you you can't really afford to select luxuries, which I think is what Chris is trying to get at here. Yeah. I think even though the value. I agree, Scott. Like in the 14th round, like, yeah, if you needed an SP5 at that point or even an SP6, I think it makes sense. But nah. when you have as many hitter spots. I, I, I can't feel bad roster. about the Wainwright pick. I, I can second guess the Ranger Suarez. Well, I think pick it's either one. There were, still, yeah. there were still good power hitters left, but they were gone by the time Wainwright went. I, I think it's either one. I but would it, it's also in the context of your first seven hitters being. Vlad, power. Austin mm -hmm. Riley, power. Altuve, not power. Um, elite one of the power, better, but one of the better power hitting sure. second baseman. Yeah. Brian Reynolds, really iffy. He had decent power last season, but kind of came out of nowhere. Alberto Mondesi, I mean, he'll hit some home runs. <laughs> he'll run into a few. Uh, but then Ozuna, fine. Oh, yeah. Soler, fine. Or no. Yeah, yeah. 
Ozuna, yep. Soler. But then, like, oh, you're I gonna didn't, be starting, I, I didn't you're gonna be starting Nicky Lopez. I, I you're gonna be starting Nicky Lopez. I didn't mention the Adalberto Mondesi thing, so yeah, I got yeah. him in round nine. <laughs> so, in, in addition to not going as crazy for power hitters as I thought I was gonna do, I made the most intentionally intentional pick, stolen base pick you could possibly make because Adalberto Mondesi was there in round nine, and it's like. Okay, guys, if nobody wants them, I, I guess I'll take them and just really not have to think about stolen bases anymore. Um, so I was pretty happy with that pick. Yeah, so here's the thing. Like, Marcelo Zuna, Jorge Soler, I ended up getting Adolis Garcia after I think those are fine. who, of course, was the 30 homer guy last year. Uh, my two catchers... Having not gotten Salvador Perez, Joey Bart, Eric Haas, if they're going to give you anything, it's going to be power. Like, I, with the exception of the two base stealers, Adalberto Mondesi and Nicky Lopez, everybody in my lineup, basically every hitter I drafted is a potential power source. They may not be the most reliable power sources, but if they're going to be good, it's because they're going to hit for power. So I, I didn't, I didn't get sidetracked by a bunch of like cutesy, Jack of all trade types, OBP specialists, you, you know, like the the DJ LeMahieu's of the world. I like I made sure, except for those two stolen base guys, to really zero in on power with my hitter picks, even if they weren't as early, <laughs> the early hitter picks that I thought they were going to be. And meanwhile, so the difference between this year and last year, I went heavier at starting pitcher this year, but I just took what came to me as opposed to you know, stretching for Kenta Maeda, stretching for Dylan Bundy because I had to have this good pitching staff. So I feel like, you know, if five of those seven pitchers I drafted live up to expectations, I should dominate the starting pitcher categories. I, I feel more confident I'm going to do this this year than I did last year. Um, and obviously, if it turns out I have too much, you can you can trade in Tout Wars, unlike TGFBI. So, uh, you know, it's it's not like I'm... It's not like there's no way to maneuver out of any excess I may have. I um, think I feel pretty good about it. You know, in retrospect, if I could change anything, it would be to swap out Zach Wheeler or Sandy Alcantara for a big bat. Yeah, I feel but like of course I that early in the draft, I had no idea the starting pitcher values were going to be what they were. Yeah, right? like I might feel better about it if you had Judge instead of Wheeler. If you had yeah. like Judge and, I mean, really the rest of the team instead of Wheeler, I feel like I would feel better about that too. Scott, did you debate taking Willie Adamas over Justin Verlander in round eight? I know you love Verlander. We're going to talk about him in a little bit, and it's a good value. But at that point, you need a starting shortstop, and I, I obviously you realize Adamas is like the end of the tier. So yeah. did you did you consider that? Uh, I yeah, I did. And then when I saw Justin Verlander there, I was just like, this is no contest. Um, you know, there was still Chris Taylor. There was still Brendan Rogers. There was still Brandon Crawford if things got really funky. There was still O'Neill Cruz. I mean, like, there, there were other things I felt like I could do at shortstop. Um, but I just kept putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. And I was ready to take Brandon Crawford in... Uh, what round was that? He ended up going in the 18th, 18th when you took Nicky Lopez. Yeah, I was ready to take Crawford in round 18. Somebody else took him a few picks before. So I was like, okay, it's it's Nick Lopez or bust, basically, at shortstop. Yeah. Um, and I, look, I like Nicky Lopez, but I wasn't intending to take him after already taking out Alberto Mondesi. Yep. And, but you know, what that that gives me a chance of being more than just a mid category finisher in stolen bases, which again, I don't feel like is the optimal way to build a team this year, but it's, you know, it's it's uh it's learning to take what's given to you. And you've got yourself an unintentional handcuff situation there as well. I know we don't talk about handcuffs in fantasy baseball, but I mean, if anything happens to Montesi or I guess Nicky Lopez for that matter, like the other one should pick up more playing time. I feel like it probably works out more for Nicky Lopez. They're both going to play, but ultimately, uh, there's a they're kind of I feel like related, correlated somehow. Uh, we are going to hit a quick break, but first, 
March Madness is here. We want you to compete with us in a bracket challenge game. I'll be in there. Scout will be in there. Chris will be in there. And we want you as well. Join us at cbssports.com slash FBT brackets. The winner not only gets to choose which FBT listener league they want to be in this year, but they also get a $100 gift card to Paramount Plus. You'll, you'll be able to watch NCAA tournament games on P+, tons of soccer from the Champions League to CONCACAF, uh, golf majors in the spring, NFL football in the fall. Also, we're excited to uh, excited for the debut of Halo, which is streaming March 24th exclusively on Paramount+. Plus. Head to ParamountPlus.com slash Halo to try it for free. And as somebody who grew up playing Halo, I'm actually super pumped for this. So yeah, it's really pretty cool. it yet, it, it looks really cool. So uh, if you need another reason to get Paramount Plus, uh, Halo is definitely one of them. But back to the brackets. Who enters just one pool? You can also create a group to compete against friends and fill out your bracket for the chance to win a trip to the 2023 Final Four. You can play on the CBS Sports app or at cbsports.com slash FBT brackets. The link is in the podcast and the YouTube description. We're going to take a quick break. More sleepers next on Fantasy Baseball Today. All right, so let's jump back into sleepers and really just try and get to as many of these as we possibly can. Our sleeper articles are live on the site if you want to uh, check out all the players that were interested in drafting later on in our drafts. Uh, but we'll just try and go back and forth and, and get to as many of these names as we possibly can. Uh, so, Scotty, let's jump back in. Another sleeper you're excited to draft this season. All right, another sleeper I'm excited to draft this year. I mentioned him earlier. Uh, I was excited to take him in. Tot Wars, Justin Verlander. I will call him a sleeper because I, I feel like a sleeper is somebody, like if, if we're going to really make a narrow definition for it, it's somebody who's uh, being slept on, right? And what that means is that they're being drafted in a way that doesn't account for their full upside. And I think that absolutely applies for Justin Verlander, who goes on average, what, around 100th overall? Um, 107.6 is yeah. the fantasy pros ADP. Yeah, and like when we last saw him healthy, he won 21 games. He had 300 strikeouts. He had a whip of .80. Like, he is a pitcher out of his time. He is capable of doing things that basically no other pitcher, with the exception of maybe Max Scherzer, is capable of doing. And I'm not saying he's going to do that fresh off Tommy John surgery. That that seems improbable. Um, but how how much of a reduction is there going to be? I think, given that he's 39 years old, his career is winding down. I, I don't I don't. I don't think he, neither he or the Astros are going to be particularly motivated to play it safe coming off the surgery. And I think, I think he's going to be fine coming off the surgery. I mean, we haven't seen him in two years. It's possible there could be some diminished skills, but I would bet on Justin Verlander. Just like he has that sort of like Nolan Ryan incapable of aging quality to him. Um, that makes me think like there, there's not a lot of downside to taking him where he goes as, as like your third or fourth starting pitcher in fantasy. So after Charlie Morton, he's probably my second favorite pitcher to draft with Adam Wainwright, who I also took on that Tout Wars team being my third favorite pitcher to draft. So yeah, Justin Verlander sleeper. All right. And we don't really talk about the finances much because I mean, for a lot of players, I don't think it matters, but the Astros signed him to a one-year $25 million deal. That is substantial. Uh, there's also a conditional option where if he reaches 130 innings this upcoming season, I wonder if that's prorated if the season gets shortened. That's, that's kind of an interesting thought. It would have to be, yeah. Um, but if he does that, if he gets to 130 innings, he gets an additional year at $25 million. So if there's any team that has followed the progress, the recovery uh, of Tommy John, it's of Justin Verlander, it's obviously uh, the Houston Astros. So I, I do like that aspect of it. And the last we heard, I mean, his most recent showcase back in November, he was throwing between 94 and 97 miles per hour with his fastball, which sound, uh, sounds a lot like Justin Verlander. Um, before we get to your next sleeper, Chris, uh, I do want to just do a quick, you know, Justin Verlander or this guy, Scott. Uh, <clears throat> so according to ADP 107.6, going right next to Blake Snell, would you rather have Verlander or Snell? 
Scott. You're muted, buddy. <laughs> I was coughing. Sorry. I would rather have Verlander. Uh, Verlander or Carlos Rodon? Verlander. Verlander or Shane McClanahan? Verlander. Verlander or Trevor Rogers? Verlander. How high can we go? Verlander or Dylan Cease? Verlander. Verlander or you Darvish? Uh, I I do think I do think I I'm gonna say Verlander. 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 It's very close, but Verlander. Verlander or Alec Manoa? Verlander. <laughs> Verlander or Charlie Morton? Morton. All right. Well, yeah, you just selected Charlie Morton ahead of him in your draft, right? So, yeah, yep. that means uh, you're getting a good two rounds worth of value um, so, based on you know where, where Scott would draft Justin Verlander. Would you like to, to know how many of those players I have ranked ahead of Justin Verlander? Yes. Charlie Morton. So I'm right uh, there with you, Scott. He's a top right. – I have Justin Verlander in the top 25. Look, there's, there are a lot of ways it could go wrong, obviously, but I just – I don't know, man. If you're talking about like, yeah, there's the potential for skills decline and we're kind of in uncharted territory with the starting pitcher having Tommy John surgery this late in his career. I'm looking at a at a database and there are not many starting pitchers who have successfully come back from Tommy John surgery at this age. Randy Wolf did it for a few games. Uh, how, but how many it, pitchers make it to 39 period? Well, that's the thing is that he's already yeah. an outlier for how well he was pitching. And there are a couple of relievers uh, high profile ones, you know, Billy Wagner had Tommy John surgery when he was 36 or 37. He came back, had one more great year, obviously as a reliever, Joe Nathan, uh, came back as a 36 year old and had a 2.09 ERA over his next two seasons after coming back from Tommy John surgery. So that's for what it's worth. You know, as we talked about with Derek on Tuesday's episode, trying to find comps is, you know, one of the better ways to, go through, um, you know, looking at injuries and there just aren't a lot of comps for him in this place, but there just aren't a lot of comps for Justin Verlander. He's arguably the best pitcher of his generation. Yep. And as you highlighted, attempting to do something that obviously is not done often in major league baseball. Uh, all right, Chris, how about you give us another sleeper you're excited about this season? All right, another sleeper I'm excited about. Well, I'll do them in a different order than I sent them to you because I don't think the next guy is necessarily the one I'm most excited about, but guy that I'm really talking myself into a lot, and this is actually not on my sleepers column that I just published last week, so it's a very recent love affair, but Reed Detmers, left-handed pitcher for the Los Angeles Angels. He is still prospect eligible and um, kind of was reminded while I was like looking up some prospect lists of Reed Detmers, I kind of let him fall off my mind because he was bad last year, 7.40 ERA and 20.2 innings. That's not good, but he also pitched in the minors. The first time he had pitched as a professional, uh, he was a number 10 overall pick in the 2020 draft. He had a 319 average or ERA with 108 strikeouts and 62 innings between double A AA and triple A. Those are, Fairly ridiculous numbers, the strikeout numbers especially, and that came along with an unexpected increase in fastball velocity. He was drafted as kind of a, I guess like a Marco Gonzalez type, like the soft tossing, crafty, projectable lefty who like maybe he doesn't have upside, high upside, but he'll get to the majors quickly and we need the help and he could be a number four starter. Well, mm -hmm. he went from throwing 90-91 to 92-94 to and that didn't help him. In the majors last season, his fastball especially got crushed, but both his curveball and slider looked pretty good last season. They had good results in very small sample sizes, and the biggest issue with the fastball seemed to just be location and command, and that was what Reed Detmers was praised for coming out. So I don't think that's going to be much of an issue for him. So this is an opportunity to get a guy who is, I believe, still uh, considered a consensus top 75-ish uh, prospect, it looks like, um, who's only 22 years old, who's shown success in the minor league level, and who has really good stuff. I mean, the fastball is not going to blow you away, but the curveball is one of the prettiest pitches in baseball. It had got really good results, and his slider looked really good last season, which was a bit of a surprise. So I think there's a lot to like about Reed Detmers, and especially because... 
Let me just pull up his ADP. It's 436.9 in NFBC drafts overall. I don't know if that's gone up over the last uh, month or so, but yeah, anytime I can get a pitcher with his kind of pedigree for, I mean, in a lot of your drafts literally for free or with literally your last round pick, I'm going to do that. It's not like there's anyone blocking him in the Angels rotation. Yeah, was, that's one of the first things I was going to mention. They have a six-man rotation listed as of now on roster resource, and that includes Michael Lorenzen, Jose Suarez, Jaime Berea. So and it's yeah, it's kind of like a it's like a philosophical question. Like, if a tree falls in the woods, does and no one hears it, does it actually happen or whatever? Or does it make a sound? Do the Angels really have a six-man rotation? <laughs> Yeah, you I know, like I, they they have six starting pitchers. They have they have five pitchers, and then they just insert Shohei Otani wherever. <laughs> right. Uh, I did want to look up the past month. The ADP for Detmers is four thirty two. What'd you mention it was, Chris? Four thirty nine, I think. Yeah, so it's uh, gone I mean, up a little bit. He's moved up like half a round, but yeah, nothing major there. Um, yeah, awesome numbers in the minors going super late in drafts. He's got the two secondaries. He's got to figure out the fastball. If he can get anything mm-hmm. out of the fastball, then uh, that will probably be the key to unlocking Reed Detmers. But we might be writing him off a little bit too quickly, especially someone who has his prospect pedigree. Uh, Scott, are you thinking about Reed Detmers or are you thinking about your next sleeper? I'm thinking about my next sleeper. Mm. All right, so have you figured it out? Yeah, yeah, Jorge Soler. All who right. I, who I also talk. took in Tout Wars here in round 12. Should I have just taken Nelson Cruz over Jorge Soler? I think I was. I think I was thinking I want to fill my outfields uh, before I run I th- out of options there. But I think where I, you were at in the draft, you really did need outfielders, Scott. So yeah, yeah. And I, I was kind of just thinking, okay, I'm going to take power hitters with my next four picks, presuming somebody else would grab Ranger Suarez and Adam Wainwright at some point during that stretch. But anyway, uh, Jorge Soler. Yeah, the reason I like him is pretty simple beginning in his final week with the Royals and then continuing through his entire stint with the Braves. He hit 277 with 18 homers and a 936 OPS. That's a 49 homer pace for a guy who hit 48 home runs in 2019. And like, okay, you could say we got hot. He, he got hot. It was, it was a small, you know, it, it was a, it was partial season statistics or whatever, but like the guy who hit 48 home runs in 2019 legitimately impacted the ball in a way that should lead to those kinds of results. And Jorge Soler has continued to do that since he's one of the best in terms of how hard he hits the ball, average exit velocity. Um, And it was apparent. Remember as last year was playing out, he was struggling early on with the Royals. You looked at the data and you're like, this guy is going to go off here at some point because not only was he impacting the ball like one of the elite sluggers, his strikeout rate was way down. He had his best strikeout rate ever last year. Um, And then sure enough, that's what happened over those last two and a half months. And obviously it carried over into the postseason. He was the World Series MVP. We don't know where he's going to end up. He's a free agent. But... uh, he has consistently shown the skills of a top tier slugger and, you know, is coming off at least a half season where he got those kinds of results too. So for where he goes, which is around 185, 190 overall, definitely on board. And for anyone who watched the world series, that home run probably still has not landed <laughs> It hit in Houston. It was an absolute mammoth shot. I don't think it really matters ultimately where Jorge Soler winds up because the type of power that he possesses, I think uh, will, will play anywhere. I mean, he's, he's just that, that strong of a hitter. And I wanted to quickly mention one of my favorite sleepers this year as well. Eddie Rosario. I feel like on a few of the mock drafts that we've done here, I keep winding up with Eddie Rosario. Scott, I know you drafted him in tout wars. Yeah, I did. Uh, and fifth he, outfielder. he goes even later than Jorge Soler. I think that they're both great values. Rosario going just outside uh, pick 200. And from 2018 to 2020, Rosario finished 53rd overall or better in Roto each of those three seasons. 53rd or better. His ADP is 201. So 
He's still just 30 years old. I think he's in the prime of his career. Got off to a slow start last year. Missed a large chunk of the season because of an abdominal strain. But once he returned with the Atlanta Braves, he was awesome. He was really good with them in the regular mm-hmm. season. He That carried over into the postseason. Yeah. I don't think there's any reason to believe that Eddie Rosario is just done, which his ADP, I don't know. I guess that's what other yeah. people think because I can't really figure out why he's going as late as he is. So I'd be suspicious of him being one of those um, middling exit velocity guys whose who's power production just potentially craters with the with the deadened baseball. And, and look, I'm still a little skeptical of it, but it helps in his case that uh, from the time he returned from the strained abdominal in, in late August through the postseason, so I'm including the postseason numbers, a 49-game stretch, he had 316 with 10 homers and a 975 OPS. He's probably not someone you want signing with like Miami. You know, what, like that, that's... what hitter do you want signing with? Miami? <laughs> yeah, but like want anyone to but like, Miami. especially a middling exit velocity. Yeah, player. that that's what right. I mean. Like the guys, like the guys who live in that like first ten rows of the outfield. Mm-hmm. That that it's you you especially don't want them going to a pitcher's park. That that's that's yeah. more what I mean. Like you know, uh, I don't know. Like Nick Castellanos, I wouldn't be as worried. Um. But, you know, Eddie Rosario, because he doesn't have the underlying, like Nick Castellanos is still going to hit 270, and he's still going to hit a bunch of doubles if he doesn't hit a bunch of home runs. Eddie Rosario, those probably turn into, you know, warning track outs rather than doubles. Yep, definitely but a that's, possibility. But otherwise, yeah, I agree with everything you said. Jorge Soler, I mean, he, he'd he probably be fine in Miami regardless. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Chris, another sleeper, who you got? All right, I'll go with the guy that I wasn't super excited to talk about first, but he's more than okay for the second one. And this is Alec Bohm, who I, I feel like four years ago, he would have fallen into the like the trendy, ooh, this guy hits the ball hard. He just needs to elevate it thing. But we've kind of moved away from that as a community. We don't get quite as excited about those guys. But that's still a profile that when the price gets low enough is worth chasing. And in Alec Bohm's case, he had an 89th percentile average exit velocity, 82nd percentile max exit velo last year, 90th percentile hard hit rate, which is really interesting because coming up as a prospect, he didn't really hit for much power, despite the fact that he's a really big dude. He's like 6'5", 225. Um, and so it was always one of those things where it's like, I didn't love him as much as everyone last year because it was a lot riding on a really, really inflated batting average. And now... You know, he has a really bad season. Strikeout rate goes up. All the numbers come down. And I'm much more interested in him. It's like another one of those like late round picks, but it's just a bet on a guy who has shown very good plate discipline in the minors. And, and you know, even in 2020, it was good enough for a, for a rookie and who showed the ability to impact the ball consistently hard last season. He just needs to elevate it. I'm not expecting him to turn into a 35 homer guy, but. I think it's a it's worthwhile to bet on Alec Bohm's pedigree and skill set based on what he's shown in the major league level. He's shown good in skills, especially with how bad third base is right now. Now, it's not clear where he's going to play. Does sound like he is a potential big beneficiary of the National League DH because his defense was very bad last season. But hey, as long as he's in the lineup. Hey, if Vladimir Guerrero can do it. Why can't Alec Bohm just race? Well, he's a, Al, Vladimir Guerrero is a little more talented. Yeah, I mean, b- both had prospect pedigree. Yeah, no, nah. <laughs> fair point. Um, <laughs> both but, were third basemen. Yeah, I mean, like, there's so many. They're both. They big, both play baseball. They're big human beings. I mean, you know, the possibilities are endless here. But seriously, if he just raises the launch angle, then I think you're onto something, Chris. He does impact the ball incredibly uh, hard and the one thing I want to see is a strikeout's got to take a bit of a step yeah. back again. I mean, they they. Got a little bit too high last season. Um, you mentioned him as a third base candidate sleeper, and I'll, I'll mention Jamer Candelario. The ADP is 273 for him, and since the start of 2020, he has an, uh, a, a line drive rate over 26, percent which is you know among the league leaders. So that obviously correlates well with BABIP and batting average overall. And he took a step forward in the second half last year, too. 282 batting average, 11 home runs, and 882 OPS. There's a lot of optimism surrounding the Detroit Tigers. They bring in Javier Baez, lots of prospects on the way, Spencer Torkelson, Riley Green. 
you know, if we're excited about the rest of those guys and, and the potential of this lineup kind of coming together, I think Candelario is going to be hitting right in the middle of it. So, again, third base, not great. Maybe you miss out on some earlier names. Jamer Candelario, Alec Bohm, a few names to uh, target there. Scott, a few more sleepers you got? Uh, yeah, I'm going to throw you a little curveball here with Jose Miranda <gasps> of the Twins. Yeah, um, minor leaguer has yet to make his major league debut, but he spent basically half the season at AAA. And um, between AAA and AA, numbers were virtually identical, and they were like Pujols in his prime, like 344 batting average, 30 home runs, 973 OPS, all with a 12.5% strikeout rate, uh, which is... Similar to Nicky Lopez, frankly. So, like, premium bat skills here. Um, it, the power was newly developed, but you know, I, I most it, it seems to be legit. He he kind of started keying in on pitches he could drive instead of just you know one thing that big contact something contact hitters like him struggle with is laying off pitches that. They can make contact with, but they can't do real damage on. And he seemed to learn to how to distinguish between the two uh, in the minors last year. And like, he probably should have gotten called up at the end of last season. He was certainly showing he was ready. I think he could have a job out of spring training. Uh, if it's not in spring training, it'll be very early in the season. He's a guy who doesn't really have like a clear defensive home. And that's why he's lower in the real world prospect rankings. But like that bat they're, they're going to find a spot for him. E even if it's like in the super utility role uh, with a lot of time being spent at DH, like they're going to get the bat in the lineup. He's third base eligible in fantasy. We can't have enough of those guys. And I think once Josh young, the Rangers third base prospect who expected to be up to early, once he tore the labor in his shoulder and, and was kind of removed as a potential draft pick, I really started keying on and, keying in on Jose Miranda as a, a late round target. Uh, and I, I've been drafting him in basically every league. I drafted him in tout wars uh, just because I, I think whenever his opportunity does come, he's going to make good on it. Yeah. I drafted Jose Miranda in TGFBI myself, a 15 team five by five Roto league. And I like pairing him with, if you miss out on one of the top tier third basemen, if you draft a Justin Turner or a Josh Donaldson or even Matt Chapman, who I drafted, uh, who I selected in that draft. I like targeting Miranda late, kind of as like an upside prospect insurance policy where if those guys don't work out, you know, maybe Jose Miranda turns into something. So uh, I do yeah. like grabbing him. And there you go. I mean, is third base really that bad? We just rattled off three of them that uh, we do like going very late in drafts. Miranda, the ADP is 356. So uh, especially in those deeper leagues. Uh, Chris, a few more names that you got here if you want to. Give him, give both of us, uh, give us both of them in like a minute or less. Yeah, Ken Giles is one. Uh, he's coming back from Tommy John surgery. The Mariners. got him in Tout Wars. Yeah, I think I have him. No, I didn't end up getting him in TGFB. I might have him in Tout Wars actually, because that's a save plus holds, and we're not sure he's going to be the closer for the Seattle Mariners. The they actually somehow after having very little idea who was going to be the closer last season, have like four viable closer options this season. They have one of the better back ends of the bullpen, at least based on projecting. Um, but Ken Giles, last time we saw him, 187 ERA in 53 innings with 83 strikeouts. He had a bad season before that. That was 2019 when he was really good. Famously quite bad in 2018 between Houston and Toronto. Had some on the mound uh, meltdowns. Um, but yeah, he had that season in 2019 while pitching through elbow issues. So, you know, if those are behind him and he comes back and he's throwing like himself, uh, you know, the, the Mariners gave him a two year guaranteed contract, knowing he wasn't going to be able to pitch in 2021 with the intention, I think of making him the closer this season. So I would say he, if he's healthy and he's right, has, you know, maybe the inside track mm -hmm. for that job and what we think is going to be a competitive team. He's so one of those I, relievers too, who, when he hasn't, like he, he only seems to function properly. As yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, he had, I want to say it was that 29, 2018 season where the overall numbers were really bad, but it was like a nine ERA and non save situations. And he was still really good as a closer. Yeah. Um, if I'm like remembering that. that correctly. So I do think there's, um, yeah. Ken Giles, one of the better late 
round save options that there hasn't been much hype around yet. And um, Alex Cobb, who, yep. you know, we're we all hoping, love Alex Cobb. <laughs> I'm hoping can take kind of, you know, more of a later career Kevin Gosman turn, but even just turning back into early career Alex Cobb with more strikeouts wouldn't be a bad thing. He rediscovered his weird splitter change up thing is what it's referred to as not the weird splitter change up thing, but the thing is what he calls it. And um, he was actually quite good last season. He only pitched 18 games, 93 innings, but 9.5 Ks per nine, a 2.92 fit to go along with a three, seven, six ERA. The peripherals were consistently better over the course of the season. And now he's with San Francisco, the team that, got the most out of Kevin Gosman and the team that, you know, seems to get the most out of everyone these days. It's a great place to pitch good defense behind him. Very good offense backing him up as well. I just think everything's pointing in the right direction for Alex Cobb um, in a way that I'm fine with him as my number five starter. There are injury concerns and durability concerns and all of that. But if he's my number five starter, and I went heavy on hitters. Totally fine with it. I think he's going to be better than a strikeout per inning with good per, with good uh, rate stats. Love it. Absolutely love it. All in on Alex Cobb this season as a late round starting pitcher as well for all the reasons that you mentioned. A few names here that I want to rattle off. Lane Thomas going very late in drafts as well. Usually wind up with him as you know my fourth or fifth outfielder in a roto league. And in his time with the Nationals last year, forty five games, two seventy batting average, seven homers four steals, and 853 OPS, strong walk rate. He cut the strikeouts down, had some, you know, okay uh, up and down seasons in the minors, but there was a few there that stood out in terms of the power and the speed. And he's a former Cardinals outfielder. I mean, these things usually work out well. I mm -hmm. mean, not for the Cardinals, obviously, but once they leave the Cardinals, they usually uh, perform quite well. He's got to get better against righties. He crushed lefties, but an opportunity to lead off for the Washington Nationals. I, I really do like uh, the power and speed potential of Lane Thomas. The last one I'll mention, Jesus Lazardo. Uh, so his final three starts last year with the Marlins, his breaking ball usage was way up, and I think that can only mean good things for him. His final start in general, 11 strikeouts. He missed time last year with a broken hand, which he did playing video games, lost in Fortnite or something. So overall, it was just like a weird year for Jesus Lazardo. The fastball mm -hmm. has to improve. He's acknowledged it. I read an article this offseason that he's been working on the fastball and he knows that it needs to be better. And if he takes a step forward with that fastball, he's got secondary stuff that is really, really good. So I will go as far as to say, like, it would not surprise me if Lazardo turns into like Lucas Giolito from a couple of years ago, because mm -hmm. even then, like nobody was drafting Lucas Giolito that those years. We basically wrote him off. I feel like mm -hmm. we're kind of doing the same thing uh, overall for Lazardo. Mm -hmm. He's just going way too late in drafts. Was a similar prospect in terms of, you know, before they made their major league debuts, very, so actually very similar paths to the majors too. I think they both had Tommy John surgery like right after they were drafted or in Lazardo's case, it might've been right before. I'm not sure, but yeah, well, I like that. Nationals. I like that comp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I like that comp for Lazardo. And the other thing I'd point out is his changeup has been pretty good in his career. The Marlins have a real thing with these changeups. All of their pitchers seem to have really, really good changeups. They, they've yep. earned the benefit of the doubt, I think, with pitchers also. Yep. They, they've just been developing them really well. Um, so I, I'm not ranking Jesus Lazardo super high, but I'm excited to see what he can do. If you've learned anything today, there is no shortage of late round starting pitchers that are interesting this upcoming season. Yeah. Uh, and with that, Scott, we are going to end with not a starting pitcher. Okay. But we're going to save the best for last. Because oh, really? if you've listened to Kokomo Friday this year, you know that Frank loves him some Connor Joe. Yes. But I am not the only one. No. No, we both love Connor Joe. Um, Connor Joe is projected to be the Rockies leadoff hitter after excelling in the role last year before a season ending injury. And, you know, he's, he's probably in five outfielder leagues. He's probably my favorite late round outfielder target. I like Lane Thomas a lot, too. I think Connor Joe is more going to give you batting average. Lane Thomas will give you some speed. Both will give you moderate power, but hopefully a lot of runs scored batting leadoff for their respective clubs. I also kind of like Rafael Ortega for the same reason, though. He might only play against righties. I also wanted to mention Mitch Garver 
because I think he's all of our favorite late round catcher targets. Yes. I believe he was second among catchers in OPS last year after finishing first among catchers in OPS in 2019. Just for the price, I think I think it's reasonable to cross your fingers on good health. All right. And, you know, I already made a wild comp with Jesus Lozardo to Lucas Giolito. I'll give you one for Connor Joe. This year's Brian Reynolds. You heard it here first. A 280 plus batting average, 20 plus home runs. We get that from Connor Joe this upcoming season. We're going to wrap there. For Scott and Chris, I am Frank. Thank you all for listening and watching Fantasy Baseball today. We'll be back again tomorrow. Bye bye.